Show me, could we have DHSC 40435, please? Lord Clark, this is a document which might um, shed some further light on what your, your thinking had been at the time about the question of funding. And so, for the sake of completeness, I'm going to show it to you and ask if you have any observations to add. It's a minute dated the 23rd of November 1984 from Dr Abrams to Dr Smithers. Sorry, I wasn't very keen on spending the £2 million. Uh, yes. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, what it says, I'll just read so, it. So they're advising each other clearly we need to play the strong devil advocate's role with the working group next week. Yes, the briefing session last night with the Minister of State for Health for his TV interview revealed that he has strong views on spending money on the blood test for HTLV3. He felt that to spend around £2 million was not cost-effective when there were so few AIDS cases and that money could be better spent elsewhere. Just pausing there, do you think that's likely to be an accurate reflection of what your views oh, are? I have no reason to doubt it. That obviously was my view. Uh, and then, Which, and with hindsight, was obviously, tragically, an incorrect opinion to hold. It was a bit... Uh, um, well, that was when we got just a handful of AIDS cases. And, and, and then, uh, as you say, um, it records arguments being set out by the um, uh, civil servant or medical officer. Um, widespread use was a virtual certainty in the US, demonstrating publicly we're doing all we could to show that our blood is safe, the, the parallel with hepatitis. Um, so that, that, that was, and in any it event... It also shows that other people by then were holding up the donor leaflet because the working group wanted to consider it. Uh, yes, I didn't ask you about that yesterday, yeah, Lord Clark, because that just accounts for a few days in the overall time, and so it doesn't, doesn't seem particularly um, um, useful to do so. Um, can we then go to January of 1985 and look at DHSC 40562? This is a minute dated the 11th of January 1985 from Dr. Smithers to Dr. Aldersdale. Um, and you'll see it says in the first paragraph, CMO wish to consider this submission prepared with administrative colleagues for ministers to obtain approval in principle for the introduction of a screening test for AIDS antibodies in the National Blood Transfusion Service. Um, Lord Clark, this draft submission went to the CMO, as far as we can understand, and not to you. Mm -hmm. But we don't have the final submission. Um, documents that I won't bore you with suggest that there were no material changes between the two. So I'm going to ask you just to look at the draft submission over the page. Uh, as I say, on the basis, our understanding is that this is effectively the, um, the, the document um, in, in, that went to, to you on the 15th of January, so a few days later. Um, summary... This submission describes the public health problems that the spread of AIDS presents and the need to reduce as far as possible the risk of its transmission by blood and blood products. It seeks ministers' agreement in principle to the introduction of a test to screen all blood donations for evidence of infection with the AIDS virus. Um, then we see um, background is uh, set out. I don't think we need to go through the detail of that. Um, yes, just sort of comment. What we're talking about here is British blood donations which I think before the break we saw there'd been a survey and they'd tested a thousand blood donations and not found any case of AIDS. Uh, the strong suspicion was that the deaths that are set out here were being, being caused by American blood products. So this question of screening British blood donors was actually, you know, was at that stage, it appeared, concerning a tiny number of possible cases. And I, d I don't know when or whether we ever had a case where anybody died as a result of blood well, transfusion. Well, I'm sure we did, but they were very, very rare. Uh, this, all this has nothing to do with American blood products. Um, you, you're, you're right, Lord Clark, that this is concerned with the safety of the blood supply in the UK. Perhaps we should look at paragraph 2C. Yes, you'll find something which answers yes. my question. I, I, I hope so, it. and there are indeed other documents that answer the question too. But It says, whilst no cases of AIDS have arisen in the UK yet as a result of blood transfusion, um, three recipients of blood donations given by a patient who now has AIDS are known to have been infected with the virus. So, Lord Clark, by this uh, so time... So it's three, yeah. There were three known to be infected. There's a pub document from the chief medical officer which addresses this. And they just, it just hadn't yet developed into the, the syndrome of AIDS. 
Um, and it has been used in factor eight as well. Yes, plasma from one of these donations yep. has contaminated a pool of plasma from many other donors and used to make factor yeah. eight. There's evidence of some 38 cases yep. in being in, um, uh, 38 haemophiliacs, I think, who've been treated with that batch. And what does it go and say about America? And then, sorry, could we just say, just in Scotland, a batch of factor eight has similarly been contaminated by an undetected yep. donor. So, Scottish so that was, it was beginning to emerge in blood donations. Yes. And then it goes on in the United States to talk about uh, 100 cases of AIDS believed to have been caused through blood transfusion and over 50 haemophiliacs um, with AIDS out of a total of 7,669 AIDS cases. Um, so that's um, uh, the, some of the information provided. And then if we just go to the next page. There's some more stuff here about expert groups considering applications to screening tests and the need to test heat treatment. Yes, I'll, I'll ask you a little about the expert advisory group on AIDS. So, uh, and that. they're producing a more widely based expert advisory group, which is meeting at the end of the month to uh, consider all this. Yeah, yes. I, I, and I, we've I, already I, had advice from the advisory committee on, uh, I hope some of these people survive, because these are obviously the people that your questions are best aimed at. It, it, um, so, some do, some don't. If we go to the next page, We'll just see where it deals with the need for a screening test. Whilst the campaign to dissuade high-risk groups from donating blood is an important interim measure, it is not enough. Experience has shown that people with the active disease and others who are infected have been donors. The confidence of patients will be lost if they cannot be assured that they will not contract AIDS from transfusions. Uh, and then, um, next paragraph, yeah. moreover, if patients receive contaminated transfusions, the disease will no longer be confined to the high-risk groups be, that be transmitted to the population at large. So that's the case that's being set out for a screening test. Mm -hmm. If we then look at the next uh, paragraph, uh, it describes the screening test itself. Um, uh, and then uh, we get down to the heading financial implications. No tests are yet available for use in regional transfusion centres. They're expected to be ready in the spring. Both American and British tests are still being developed. The likely cost will be, and then the details they're given a reference to the British test being more sensitive and more suitable to install and likely to be cheaper. And then over the page, we see what, what you were being asked to decide, because the, 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 this, this is a submission that we'll see goes to you as well as others. The test for AIDS antibodies will not guarantee the purity of donated blood. There is a time lapse between infection and development of a detectable antibody. Complete assurance will have to await development of a test for the AIDS virus itself. There's no doubt that despite these problems, the balance of advantage lays clearly with the introduction of a routine test of donations as soon as possible. Um, so that's the advice that was being set out. Ministers are asked to agree in principle to the introduction of a screening test for AIDS antibody for all blood donations and to an announcement made to this effect at the appropriate moment, indicating that the development of a test is being backed by the department. Um, th there's some more detail in the submission, but I think in, in, in terms of looking at the context of your response. Yes, it's still looking enough. forward, because at this stage, we haven't actually got the tests available. Um, and then if we go to, and, and that's why the agreement is, is one in principle, yes. Yeah. If we go then to DHSC 0002482, please. DHSC 0002482, sorry, underscore 012. My apologies, Shanek. DHSC 0002482. Did, did any of this hold up the introduction of tests? My, my understanding is that the tests were started as soon as the supplies they then adequately proved, and as soon as we got the supplies available. Uh, um, Lord Clark, I'm afraid that I asked the questions rather than answer them, but that is a point well, you make. Can't we get to the ones your, that are the point? That is a, a point you make in your witness statement. You, I know you that seems to be the, the key problems. point on testing. Were, 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 were they delayed in any way? Um, if I can't could, understand why we're going through all this tedious detail on the interpretation of documents, most of which I've never seen in my life before, till they were sent to me by the inquiry. 
Well, the document we've just looked at, Lord Clark, was the submission sent to you, and the document we're now going to look at is a document authored by you. Right. Sorry, I won't, I won't slip back in. Uh, and and you, you are Expressing my exasperation. You are perfectly entitled to say in relation to it, as you say in your statement, this did not, in fact, hold up the introduction of the testing. Yeah, the, the weather held up. I mean, just asking as a matter of fact. not going to answer the question, Lord Clark. I just don't think they were, were they? Um, That'll be a matter for the chair to decide in due course, having well, heard Is there any evidence that they were? Um, so well, well put, put, it, put it this way. My, my understanding at the moment is that you, screening was introduced uh, in October 1983. Sorry? Screening of blood donations was introduced universally in October 1985. That's 10 months or so on from January 1985, obviously, uh, which is uh, a little while after uh, tests were in the process of, de of development, I have to consider the, that process, whether that was uh, reasonable or not. Were, were they ready to be introduced in January 85? Well, I, I, I don't... I, 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 I don't I'm, know. I'm listening to the evidence in order to draw conclusions, whatever they may yeah. be. I'm, I'm not a witness who knows that. You don't. Uh, and so it's, it's, I can't answer that at the moment. I hope to be able to answer that in due course. Lord Clark, may I assist if I explain? You're the first witness giving oral evidence who's had some um, some involvement in the introduction. I wasn't of the developing the tests. No, some involvement in the decision making in relation to the to the, the introduction of the tests. And so this, the purpose of looking at these documents in part is to enable people to understand what the department was and was not being asked to consider at the time. Uh, so if we look at your response of, of the um, 22nd of January 1985, it's addressed to the Chief Medical Officer. Thank you for your submission of the 15th of January. This looks inevitable, I suppose. Could I have drafts... Is this my response? This is your response. Could I have drafts, please, of the proposed public announcement of both points? Could I also have a draft of a letter to go to all Chairman of Regional report. Health Authorities explaining our proposals? How did Welcome corner this market and why did they bring CAMR in? Will the cost be met from the income now going to the blood transfusion service from the charges introduced for the handling of blood to private hospitals? I never did understand what else that money was to be spent on. Um, and then you say this, before we all panic further, it is presumably the case that the ending of the collection of blood from homosexuals greatly reduces the risk from blood collected in this country. Also, as only haemophiliacs have died, and they may have had factor eight from American blood, is it the case that we have not had one AIDS fatality from blood donated in this country yet? Do we need this and heat treatment of the blood? Um, whatever effect this did or didn't have on the introduction, Law Clerk, is it right to understand this as you expressing a degree of scepticism or an example of you I'm challenging, challenging, I'm challenging the, advice? the challenging the advice we're having, we're getting? Because I say there's the, the health service. Every, 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 I mean, nowadays the. Health service spends three times, I think, in real terms, what we were spending then. But however much you spend, there are always endless competing claims, worthy claims, for more resources. So you do have to challenge things. That's, that's, you know, I, I, can't, I couldn't then give an expert opinion myself on the relative value of all these things. I had to be guided by the scientific advice. But this is me asking questions and just checking that they're satisfied that this is, is really necessary and that it's going to work if we go ahead with it. And that this is, this is just all part of the ordinary process of decision-making. Practically any other decision in the department, you'd find the ministers, if they're doing their job, are, are doing this kind of thing. And, and then c c can you help us with understanding what, what y you meant when you talk about what, before we all panic further? Well, as you may gather, I was rather worried about causing panic, large because of, well, to put it more sensibly, to use more, more, more formal words for an inquiry of this kind, the, the one thing that everybody was concerned about was destroying trust in the blood transfusion system. Now, there are various ways you can do that. You could destroy trust by not doing anything about the risk of AIDS, or you could destroy trust by giving the public the impression that the blood supply being used by the service was completely contaminated. Uh, and you've got to somehow strike the balance of informing the public and making sure that the reporting of it and that the public understanding is, is between the two and they don't panic for either reason. The reason you don't want panic is because you do so, you'll suddenly start losing donations to the service 
and patients will be terrified to have an operation if it needs a blood transfusion, and you will start doing terrible damage. That that is um, that, that is why I, I, I see I do I did keep using this word, probably being influenced by the, the background. I won't complain about it again, of some some of the newspaper reporting we were getting. Um, and then um, I just want to ask you about the, the next sentence in that paragraph, uh, where you say, um, as only haemophiliacs have died. You, you say in your witness statement that that is a phrase that has been taken out of context previously. Well, the only haemophiliacs was taken out of context by a campaigner, uh, as though I was referring only, as mere, only merely haemophiliacs have died. Uh, it was it's a statement of fact that I was just checking, I was asking the question, I was asserting. My understanding was, so far, only people who died were haemophiliacs, and they may have had factor eight from American blood. So I'm asking the question, just in case it ever became relevant to any future discussion, is it actually the case that we've not yet had one AIDS fatality from blood donated in this country? And the whole context is that final question. I just wanted to know, is it the case that we have not had one AIDS fatality from blood donated in this country? And it, it, it might be said that using the phrase only haemophiliacs have died um, might suggest thinking that in the great scheme of things, a handful of haemophiliac deaths were no, relatively... That's, uh, that really is the most dreadful spin I'm, on I'm, two words. I'm putting the proposition to you so that you have your well, opportunity Well, I'm answering to... it quite firmly. I do, do object. That's just, I mean, when that's, it's done, it happens all the time. They must have heard countless ministers and politicians say, for God's sake, if you look at it in context, it plainly doesn't mean that. And I mean, it's a technique that's used all the time in political debate. And in your statement, you say that this was emphatically not disparaging haemophiliacs or devaluing the importance of haemophiliac I don't, I don't disparage haemophiliacs. I have the greatest respect for haemophiliacs as every other citizen. And I'm not indifferent. One death is a tragedy. I'm not indifferent to the death of anybody. The fact was, so far, I was checking, I wasn't sure. Have we so far, have, only, have all the people who died been haemophiliacs who've had factor eight? Is it, or is it not, I could have put in, the case that we've not yet had one AIDS fatality from blood donated in this country. Um, and, now, and that's just seeing how far we can reassure people that don't put off your operation because you think you're going to be killed by the blood transfusion. Now, unless We never did get that. We avoided that panic. And unless um, you want me to, Lord Clark, I'm not going to take you to the responses from the Chief Medical Officer to your memo. You've set those out in your witness statement. No, I'm sure I wouldn't challenge whatever he said. Uh, um, I just want to then look at the position as at February 1985, um, so the, the, the month after, after um, this, in terms of what action the government was or was not taking. Um, as we've seen, um, you've declined central funding for the screening tests. That's the first decision taken. Well, it didn't decline funding, but I thought it should come out of the regional yes. budget. Yeah. Uh, hence my use of the word central. Um, and then if we go to DHSC 0002261 underscore 031... We'll see this is a letter from, of the 20th of February 1985 to regional health authorities or to the regional general uh, managers. And if we... Sorry, please forgive me for a moment. Um, if we look at the third paragraph... Um, you'll see it says there, we hope a reliable screening test compatible with existing equipment will be available within a few months. There is as yet no firm indication of what this will cost. As a broad indicator, it would be prudent to assume for planning purposes a cost of around £2 per test, although we hope for a lower figure. Although there are many competing calls upon your resources, this test, when available, will be an important preventive development meriting a, high, a very high priority. We will be grateful, therefore, in firming up the budgets for 1985-6. to six. You would make suitable provision... 
as soon as there is firmer in information about when in 1985 the test will be available and how much it will cost, we will let you have it. We need to be able to assure patients that treatment involving blood or blood products does not expose them to a risk of contracting AIDS. I should add that the Blood Products Laboratory at Elstree hopes that all its factor eight will be heat treated from April 1985 uh, onwards. Um, so... Um, if we just go over the page, we'll see this is copied, um, amongst others, to uh, your private office. Um, and I haven't taken you through the various drafts, but... Well, as I've said, it, I, 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 we've no means of knowing whether I ever actually put it in front of me. Y yes, I, well... I mean, it's, it's obviously... I, I don't mind. It looks to me like a perfectly sensible... Yes. So uh, it, the message is being sent out to regional directors. So it, it, is this right? In terms of, of the action being taken by the department in February 19, by night February 1985, having decided not to use central funding, you have, however, when I say you, the department, and there is evidence to suggest that you, you're aware of this. There's a criticism implied, Bill Clark. Um, the department uh, ha was writing to regional health authorities, essentially to tell them to plan ahead. So you do it, yeah. Um, and then if we look at... I mean, all, all these heads of... One of the things you had to decide with all these heads of expenditure was should it should have come out of the central budget, should it should have come out of the regional budget. But nobody seems to be stopping spending the money on it. Yeah. And then if we look at DHSC 302261 underscore 043... Um, this is an extract from Hansard, 20th of February, 1985. Um, we'll see it's you from the bottom right-hand corner. Um, there's a long answer. Um, if, if we go over the page, there's just one bit I want to um, look at. A right-hand column, second paragraph. This is where you refer to, um, where you say, fourthly, tests to screen blood donations for HTLV3 antibody are being developed and we are coordinating the evaluation work needed to ensure that such a test can be introduced routinely in the National Blood Transfusion Service as soon as possible. And then there's reference to the letter to regional health authorities. This is, so it seems to be uh, a long written answer setting out everything we were doing. Yes. Um, just at the moment concentrating on screening tests. So it, it would appear that as at February 1985, the position from the department's perspective is ask regional health authorities to set aside the money and coordinate the evaluation process. Is that and fair? a test will be introduced in the service as soon as possible. That's the key thing. Um, now... Which budget it came out of doesn't at the moment strike me as frightfully material. If, if we move on to later in 1985, um, you had an exchange of correspondence um, with, um, I think, Sir Philip de Zuleta, I may have mispronounced that, um, if we just have a look at the... I'm familiar course. with that name. Who was he? Well, uh, um, um, I'm going to get the drugs company wrong if I don't check the document. DHSC 40221, Abbott, I think. Uh, 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 he, was, he was in the pharmaceutical industry. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. There may be another more famous one. Um, so if we go, um, we'll, we'll see this letter written to you... Um, You'll see he says he's on the board of Abbott Laboratories. Um, that's in the first paragraph. Um, uh, and he writes um, explaining that Abbott had developed a screening test uh, um, to detect um, antibodies uh, uh, responding to the virus that causes AIDS. If we go further down the page, we can see the second paragraph. He says, this is well known to your department who are evaluating... And it's been licensed in America. Yes. Who are, so all this is well known to your department who are indeed engaged in evaluating the Abbott test for possible use in this country. The reason why I'm writing to you at this stage is that although I am myself no medical expert, I'm getting a bit concerned at the rather slow progress being made in this no doubt necessary evaluation process. Uh, and then he sets out there um, a, a concern that two evaluations are being tested out, uh, are being undertaken, um, uh, the second of which... Um, uh, would involve a number of tests in the blood transfusion service. Um, and then the last paragraph... Uh, uh, he, he says, no foul, no case of AIDS due to a blood has been detected. Yeah, yes. N um, again, not, not correct if, if one substitutes HGLB3 for AIDS, but leaving that aside... Anyway, he's trying to sell his company's uh, test. Yes, and so he says in the last sentence, I should be much happier if I felt that there was a definite plan for evaluation of the Abbott test with dates mm -hmm. to which the department would try to adhere. 
Um, I just want to show you the, your, your response, um, uh, Lord Clark. This is really all part of a, showing you the relevant documents so that I can ask you some general questions, if you understand. So, uh, if we look at your risk, well, the, your response is at DHSC 00001569. Um, in response of the 5th of June 1985, um, you set out in the second paragraph that the, uh, the intention is to carry out the evaluation of the tests in two stages, um, and you explain in the last sentence of that paragraph it's not possible to give a timetable for completing the task. Uh, you then set out in the third paragraph concern to ensure that any test we do introduce is reliable, doesn't create more problems than it solves. Um, I want to just show you... a a minute that refers to the this correspondence and then ask for your reflections on it. So it's DHSC 00002311 underscore 016. Um, we can see it's a minute from Mr. Harris. Sorry, can we just look at the date? Thank you. 30th of May 1985. If we go to the top of the page... We can see it's addressed to your private office. It may be helpful for MSH to have a little background since the reply is less helpful than Sir Philip may like. Um, Abbott's one of the first companies to develop an AIDS antibody test. They would dearly like to tie up the NHS market. We're evaluating tests as they become available. The work is being done by the PHLS. After an initial technical evaluation, they'll be tested again for operational acceptability in the blood transfusion context. Uh, technical evaluation of Abbott and one other will probably be completed by July. We'll then be under some pressure to complete any extra evaluation quickly. Certainly the 10,000 test proposal referred to may well have to be truncated. And then this. Um, it would not be helpful to have no other choice than Abbott since their test requires special equipment. It would also be preferable to have a British test evaluated as a possible candidate. Um, and then it goes on to say it's therefore not desirable to be precise about the timetable for testing Abbott's test in isolation. What could, are you able to assist us as to why it was thought preferable within the department to have a British test as a possible candidate? No, I must have liked it to be cheaper. I mean, <laughs> this is one. This is one, one. You know, this is all around a change of a letter. It's change of letters amongst probably thousands of letters, hundreds of letters I sent that year. I'm afraid I can't remember the background to it. Um, and obviously, it's as. This, this, whoever this official is, says, Abbott are trying to move in quickly to try to corner the British market. And he's explaining uh, the process by which we need to test it. And it, obviously, no minister can be asked to introduce the tests until we have quite satisfied that it's safe and then also quite satisfied that it's effective. And, but that's just my paraphrasing what the memo obviously says. There's a further exchange of correspondence between you and Sir Philip, but I'm not going to go to, 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 to that. It's essentially along the same, the same themes. Um, you say in your witness statement, I think, by this time, it's Mr Patton leading on this policy. Are you able to assist us with... I why? haven't checked with John Patton. I don't, I've no doubt you've asked him. Um, uh, I, I, it isn't altogether clear from the documents who... But presumably Simon Glenarthur was no longer... He'd gone to another department. I yes, think. I think he'd been succeeded There'd been by a Baroness reshuffle, Trump. a minor reshuffle, and uh, we'd now acquired uh, John Patton, who's still very much about. I haven't seen him for a long time, but he's still about. I think. Do, do you know whether there had been um, an express transfer of this allocation of special responsibility to Mr Patton? Um, well, I, I wouldn't know, but... Uh, uh, and nor not normally happened. I say we didn't alter these, we didn't shuffle these responsibilities around wildly every time there was any change. So what would normally happen if you did have a change of ministers and Simon was moved to another job, would be whoever succeeded him would take on his responsibilities. I just, but I don't know. You'd have to look it up. And best way is to ask John Patton. Um, there is then um, a paper in June of 1985 um, sent to ministers. Uh, if we look at DHSC 302311 underscore 019. Um, so you'll see, Lord Clark, it's a minute dated the 7th of June 1985. 
Um, uh, and if we look at the bottom of the page, copies to Ms Bateman. So it goes to your private office as well. It certainly does. Um, and then we can see, in the, if we go to the text of it, the attached paper sets out the proposed strategy for introducing a screening test for blood donations as previously agreed. Uh, and then um, uh, uh, we have a summary of the strategy. Present plan should be confirmed before introduction. Available tests should be evaluated by the Public Health Laboratory Service and in the Blood Transfusion Service. So those are the two stages of evaluation. Um, uh, uh, and then various other matters set out, um, in including funding of the Public Health Laboratory Service being increased. Um, and then if we go over the page, we'll see the paper. Again, I'm not going to go through all of it, Lord Clark. If we just look at paragraph two to start with, screening has not yet started in the UK. It is in use nationally in Australia, widespread in the USA and the Netherlands. France and Germany will introduce it nationally later this summer. Cases of AIDS contracted through the use of UK donated blood have not yet occurred but can be expected. When these are announced, the publicity may well draw comparisons between action abroad and apparent inactivity here. Um, and then if we go to the top of the next page... Oh, no, I'm sorry, let me just take it a little more slowly. Bottom of the, the previous page... Selection of a test sets out options. Select an available test on current knowledge as soon as possible. Select after evaluation of tests by PHLS or select after both evaluation and blood transfusion service field trials. So three options, introduce now, introduce after the first evaluation or wait for both evaluations. And then if we see the top of the next page, Paragraph 5, the paper says the choice between these options will reflect the balance of advantage between having a test in place quickly as a defence against criticism of tardiness or waiting until we have a test which can be confidently recommended for BTS use. There's then a, a fairly detailed... Um, well, the, 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 there's, there's, a there's a, then a whole lot of it. Add analysis protocol. of the problems if you can't getting it wrong. Yeah. It, it, exactly. There's, so the merits of each option are discussed um, from paragraph seven um, onwards. And you'll see from what's underlined, Lord Clark, that options one and two were not recommended by officials to, to ministers. And if we go over the page... you'll see the recommended option at the top of the page, select after the Public Health Laboratory Service evaluation and field trials in mm -hmm. the Blood Transfusion Service. This may take five months to implement. This is the recommended option. It will enable the level of false positives to be measured. It will also allow operational... Yeah, is that the recommendation to ministers? This is, to, this is the recommendation to ministers. It might leave us without a screening test for up to two further months. It's hoped to bring forward the field trials and thus reduce the period needed for implementation. Um, and if we go two pages further on, you'll see there the summary of the suggested strategy in paragraph 15.1 repeats the recommended option and explains that that means it's implementation in October or November. And then under the heading advice sort, are ministers content with the strategy outlined above? I'm not going to ask you about the funding for the Public Health Laboratory Service. Um, just um, two further documents then, Lord Clark, and then I'm going to ask you some general questions about the process, <coughs> if I may. Um, there's a document from the Chief Medical Officer and then a view expressed by clinicians um, that I'm going to just ask you to look at so you can see, as it were, the rival contentions. The document from the Chief Medical Officer is at PRSC, no, sorry, DHSC 00002311 underscore 021. Um, this is from Donald Aitchison, dated the sixth... Sorry, top of the page. It's from Donald Aitchison, yeah, Aitchison. Yes, I think the date is... Chief Medical Officer. 10th of June. It's to, it's to Mr Patton, but it's also bottom of the page, copied to, um, to your private office, Miss Bateman. And if we just see what the Chief Medical Officer says, th there is a finely... <coughs> excuse me. There is a finely balanced decision here, but I'm in favour of the suggested line... I think, however, that we must do everything possible to ensure that PHLS is able to keep to its schedule. As far as the option to introduce a partially evaluated ELISA test forthwith is concerned, I think the prospect of wasting a relatively small quantity of blood from false positive tests is not the major objection. 
And the major problem is that scientists concerned at PHLS do not yet have confidence that the suppliers could produce testing kits which are reliable on a large scale and which would continue to be reliable on the shelf. It would be worse to be in a position of having to withdraw a test once introduced than to be in our present position of, of carefully evaluating the tests. There could also be ethical problems in refusing to tell donors who are volunteers in this country the result of a test carried out on their blood if they wish to have it. Ministers should recognise, however, that support for a different view is likely to appear in the medical press, see Professor Bloom's letter attached, and considerable public pressure would develop if in the meantime a case of AIDS develops in a recipient of UK blood. Such a case or cases is likely to occur sooner or later due to infection one or more years ago prior to our warnings to people at risk not to donate blood. So you, we've got to the stage, Lord Clark, you've got the submission from officials, that's the Chief Medical Officer's view... Yes, it's a pity we haven't got Donald Atchison alive at the moment because he was the authoritative person in the department to express the final, you know, normally in, in, a decisive view on this subject. And then I just want to show you um, then the, the letter he refers to, the letter in the medical press from clinicians um, expressing a contrary view, which is DHSC 30-3828 underscore 191. Uh, it's a publication in the British Medical Journal, 22nd of June, 1985, headed um, HTLV3, Haemophilia and Blood Transfusion. If we just go down to the text of the letter. Um, if we pick it up, Lord Clark, in the middle column, last paragraph, um, the, the authors of this letter say this. All these considerations... Who, who, who's written this? I'm, I'm sorry. Let's look on the right-hand side. <coughs> Professor Bloom, chair of the UK oh, yeah, Haemophilia sure. Centre yep, yep. Directors' Organisation, um, Dr Forbes, chairman of the yep, UK you know. AIDS Groups, Dr Ritzer, chair, secretary of the UK Haemophilia Centre yep, Directors' Organisation. Yep. So, Thank you. Uh, Haemophilia clinicians, leading haemophilia clinicians. So um, all these considerations underline the need rapidly to introduce screening for HDLV3 antibody for all blood donations. Three commercial test kits have now been approved by the American Food and Drug Administration, and although there may be a small number of false positives, it's unreasonable to delay testing until this possibility is eliminated. Donations <coughs> which are found to be positive for HTLB3 antibodies should be discarded. The logistics of retesting, confirmatory testing and donor counselling can then be dealt with as separate important issues. <coughs> and they refer to a particular review. We believe that donors would readily accept this interim measure because, after all, they are themselves potential recipients. Although such testing will be expensive, we think that it should be implemented as soon as possible to protect recipients and to preserve public confidence in our blood transfusion services. Um, and, and then they re refer to the fact that when testing is fully impl implemented, the role of single donor cryoprecipitate in the management of haemophilia can then be reassessed. Uh, so you're, you're, the purpose of taking you to those, Lord Clark, is first of all so you can see the material available to you and your colleagues. Well, it's available to my and colleagues. None of this would have been shown to ministers at the time. The letter wouldn't have been shown to ministers. The chief medical officer. Yeah, yeah, but not the, the, the idea that we'd be taken through all this. It's only this is a d debate you're drawing my attention to, obviously going on between medical experts. Yes, Th this letter was. Yeah, none of that would have gone to ministers. It would have been completely pointless to put it to the, ministers. This letter was, or an extract from it, was expressly referred to in the chief medical officer's letter to. Well, to, kind to of. It's, it's an example of what he had in mind. He knew pe some people didn't agree. Yeah. Yes. Which he very fairly told us. And the advice he gave. Um, now, the, the, the ultimate decision that's made... We wouldn't have had the time to go through all this uh, at the time. <coughs> I, I just want to show you the decision that was made and announced by you then um, in, in later in June of 1985 at HSOC 0018679. If we go to the third page, please. And we look top right-hand column. The date is the 27th of June, 1985. Um, and, and you're announcing the decision. I'm pleased to say that a test will be introduced within the next few months to screen all blood given by blood donors for antibodies to the virus which causes AIDS. Uh, and then if we skip to the next paragraph, I understand and share the concern to get these tests in use as soon as possible. However, we must have tests which are accurate and can be trusted 
A number of test kits are already available and in use abroad, but reports from those countries suggest that the tests are not entirely reliable. We believe that no test should be introduced in the UK until its reliability has been established. There's no point in introducing a test which often fails to detect antibodies in blood or detects antibodies where there are none. An evaluation programme is being undertaken by the Public Health Laboratory Service and National Blood Transfusion Service experts as a matter of urgency. It's essential to complete this programme if we are to have a sensible policy that really does protect the public. Contrary to reports in today's press, no decisions on choice of test kits have yet been made. We hope that we'll be able to introduce a test within four to five months. We're also making arrangements to offer counselling to anyone whose blood is found to be positive. So the upshot is ministers have, as an announced by you, gone th for the recommended option of waiting for the two evaluations to be completed. Is that yeah. right? Um, it's all rather familiar, isn't it, really? I mean, if, if I allow, the present COVID thing, test and trace has caused the present government unbelievable problems getting a test and trace system in over the last 18 months and people will carry on arguing about it for till kingdom come and i have no doubt one day there'll be an inquiry into it all which will have a similar exchange about how test and trace was handled on covid but we fortunately didn't get into the that scale of difficulties and uh, as you see as you say we and that explains very carefully why you do have to be sure that the test is sufficiently accurate and it there obviously wasn't a problem about this test being, test being safe. Now, just, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you some general questions without going to further documents, but just so you know that there are then various other documents, some of which might have come to you, some of which probably didn't. I probably wouldn't look be able to help on which I'd seen, which yeah, I hadn't. Which look at the outcome of the evaluation at the first stage um, and, and then discuss the second um, stage and, and the question of which particular tests to use. I'm not going to take you to any of that. Is there a suggestion that they could have been introduced properly and safely earlier than it was? Well, that, that, broadly speaking, that's, what I, that's what I want to ask you about, Lord, Lord, Lord Clark. Oh. But first of all, you will have seen, and your colleagues, Mr Patton, will have seen from, from the submission that um, by the time a decision is being taken, looking forward to introduce it in the autumn by, by the department, a test was already in operation in a number of other countries. Um, um, was the fact that other countries already had a test in place and that several more months would elapse before the UK was going to introduce it, something that was a matter of concern, as far as you can recall, to you, to you or colleagues in the But department? it also says in some other countries there were serious doubts about whether they should have introduced it yet because serious doubts about their reliability. Yes. So it always happens. It, well, it appears to always happen. Fortunately, it doesn't happen frequently, but it's, it, you know, half of this is a complete echo of the, the present COVID debate. Yes, it, it, it's not, in fact, entirely clear what the factual basis is for that, but that's not a matter that we'll be able to help. No, 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 but it's no good taking me through the factual no, basis. And I'm not going to... I don't know what uh, testing was like in 1985 the, the, in the, 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 the question really is, or the issue really is this, Lord Clark, you've, you've described and we've seen examples of how you wouldn't simply accept matters that were presented to you, but you would challenge, you yeah. would test, you would ask questions. Um, do you recall... Or, um, um, any testing, probing, challenging of, of why it was it was taking the UK rather longer to introduce tests than oh. other countries? No, I don't. But, I mean, it happens all the time. Different countries adopt slightly different approaches. With hindsight, you can usually see which have done it best. Um, and it, it, it could be said that with a... And indeed, this was the point being made by the, the, the haemophilia clinicians, I think, in, in part and brought to the attention of the chief medical officer, that where you have a disease such as AIDS, no treatment, no, no cure, very high mortality rate, that, that the, the better approach is to do what you can, even if it is imperfect, to reduce risks, rather than wait until you have absolute the best inclusive approach reliability. The is to take the best scientific and medical advice you can, challenge it if you wish to, or things occur to you, and if it seems sound and authoritative advice, to act on it. Not, not start playing amateur doctors and reaching your own judgment about how to introduce it. You, you, you were provided with these materials for the purpose of, of, of your statement, Lord Clark, and, and you, your statement goes through them in more d detail in, in, uh, than I'm going to in terms of your uh, oral evidence. Looking back now, do you have any concerns about the length of time it took for the... Uh, Not on what you've shown me, no. Um, can, 
can we then come? Perfectly clear and good reasons are given and recommended by the chief medical officer for following the approach that we adopted. That's why I keep asking you, has anybody ever suggested we delayed it? I've never, never heard before Any, anybody ever has suggested we delayed it. Well, it, it is an issue for resolution in the inquiry, Lord Clark. Probably the first time the anybody's ever made that claim. Um, uh, c can I then turn to the question of... of if um, the inquiry found that, I would reject the conclusion. Um, uh, I'm going to turn to the question of um, publications by the Chief Medical Officer um, um, and, and just look at uh, three references to materials produced by the Chief Medical Officer and then ask you a, 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 a more generally about that. So, if we could start with BART 40814, please. I mean, going back to the testing thing, the, pro the problem, I understand the problem you face, because they're not alive anymore. You, you can't ask any questions of a lot of the people who are actually the key people in making the decision. I mean, we're just going through a collection of documents we happen to have to try to see, if we can cast doubt on what they were doing. Uh, it's very difficult. I, mean, I, I sympathise with your problem. There's, there's no direct evidence anymore, but it reads all right to me, as I can't see any reason why anybody suggests that the testing was held up. Um, if we go to... Oh, thank you, it's on screen. So you'll, you'll see, um, Lord Clark, um, this is a communication from the Chief Medical Officer, um, December 1984. To all regional transfusion directors. Yes, yes. so it's a public... So he used to send out these, uh, uh, these information things occasionally. And you'll see um, the, the accompanying minute reads, I enclose for information a copy of CMO's press release on the 20th of December 1984. This followed media inquiries after the report in The Guardian on the 20th of December 1984 of two cases of alleged AIDS transmission through blood donations. And if we go over the page, we'll, we'll see the press release from um, Donald Aitchison, um, dated the 20th of December 1984, uh, and he is recorded as saying this, donations of blood and blood plasma have been given by a person who was subsequently admitted to hospital in Wessex in October and later diagnosed as suffering from AIDS. His donations of both blood and blood plasma have been traced, all possible remedial action taken. His donations of blood were given to three recipients. They've been identified and are being followed up. Two of these recipients were a mother living in Birmingham, a 78-year-old man living in Wessex. Uh, the third is a man aged about 40 from Wessex. All three recipients, when tested, have proved positive in the HTLV3 antibody screening test, so infected with an HTLV3, essentially. None of them has AIDS. In other words, it hasn't yet developed into AIDS, Lord Clark. Um, yes, you, you could have the antibodies, but uh, it keeps cropping up. You could have the antibodies, it doesn't necessarily develop into the full-blown disease, if you're well, lucky. The, there was, uh, certainly, that, there was, there was mm. a question about that at the early stages. Um, and then we can see uh, uh, um, Dr. Aitchison goes on then to explain that this particular donor's plasma had also been used in the manufacture of a batch of factor VIII. 38 patients um, in Wessex and South Wales suffering from haemophilia had already received some of this batch of factor VIII. They're being traced and monitored. Um, uh, um, and then top of the next page, we'll see then... Dr. Aitchison is recorded in the second paragraph as continuing by saying, I'd like to stress that anyone who's advised to have a blood transfusion or, or has been given a transfusion shouldn't worry because the risk of getting contaminated blood is extremely small. Even if a person has proved positive yeah, in the antibody screening test, the kind of reassurance that used to bother me, yeah. AIDS, yes. um, And then there's some reference um, um, to selection of blood donors, development of screening test, and heat treatment. Um, now, I... Just showing you that really as an example of a publication from the chief medical officer. There's one more document I want to show you before I ask you a question. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, is there? I, I mean, I just want to make clear. I would be very upset if 30 odd years later people start criticizing Donald Atchison. He was an extremely nice man. He was very impressive. He was supremely conscientious. I mean, total contrast with his predecessor. Uh, uh, and if Donald had been accused of carelessly handling the risk to haemophiliacs or anybody else, he would have been deeply, deeply distressed. He's dead. He can't answer questions about it. He can't be cross-examined. So I hope no one's going to go into the 
tedious analysis of paragraphs in stray documents in order to produce criticism of Donald Addison and his colleagues for causing delays which I do not believe for one moment they caused. The, the, the purpose of, of the questioning, I hope, is not to criticize or put forward criticism because the inquiry starts with no criticism to make. It is inquiring uh, and it needs to understand what was happening. There may, in the light of that understanding, be criticisms made later. There may not, but I need to have understanding first. And this yeah. is part well, of Well, I, I agree that's your task. I never have quite understand how you're meant to second guess the people on the ground handling it almost 40 years ago. But there we are. S someone set up the inquiry believing you could do that. Lord Clark, the, the purpose of showing you that and one other document I'm going to take you to in a moment is nothing to do with the textual analysis of the document. Right, oh, sorry, I'll stop okay. interrupting you. It's, so the second document is DHSC 00005140. And it's a minute from the Chief Medical Officer dated the 30th of July 1985. And if we just look at the second paragraph, Halfway down, well, no, actually, I'll pick it up third line. Although it is unlikely that the, th this is about the, the issue of heat treated mm -hmm. products, Lord Clark. Although it's unlikely that there are any stocks in the country of unheat treated commercial factor eight, I'm arranging that a letter will go to all haemophilia centre directors in order to draw their attention to the availability of heat treated factor eight and the need to avoid using any commercial unheat treated factor eight, which may remain from 1984. Uh, now, look, what we've seen in those two examples... And this, this is what finally solved the problem. As it turned out, whichever genius started trying out heat-treating things actually stopped, and too late, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the people being killed. Um, uh, and that... But I have known nothing whatever about the experimenting, the testing and the authorising of heat treatment. And I'm asking you no questions whatsoever about mm. that, that, that topic. That, uh, what I've shown you are two documents emanating from the Chief Medical Officer. One, a statement to the public, setting out what was happening, what was known, information about people being infected, numbers infected, and so on. That's the first document we looked at, December 1984. The second, referred to here, in the middle of 1985, is an, a, a letter that's going to go to clinicians to draw their attention to, amongst other things, the need to avoid using unheat-treated factor eight. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I'm showing you those, Lord, Lord Clark, is, is to uh, ask whether there is any good reason that you can think of why similar communications could not have been uh, um, promulgated, whether by the department or by the chief medical officer, it doesn't matter which chief medical officer, at a much earlier stage. Well, I can't answer that question. I played no part in sending out such communications. You'll have to ask whoever sent it. Oh, well, I obviously can't ask Donald Aitchison, but in terms of um, um, this, would you, would you agree that it doesn't appear that Donald Aitchison thought it was an interference with clinical freedom to, to send a letter along those no, lines? No, he, he, would, well regarded, he, he was an expert, he was the leading, and hence he did, as I said yesterday, he sent out information letters when he felt he could add to what they could read from the medical press. He was a clinician and he drew on expert clinical advice. What was an interference with the clinical freedom of doctors would be for a politician, a non-medical politician, a minister, to start thinking his or her job was to tell doctors how to treat their patients. Sir Donald Asherson is an extremely distinguished medic. He's in a totally different position. Part of his job was to keep track of these things. And I say, he was, I'm not just being polite because he's dead or anything, he was one of the more impressive public servants I ever worked with. He was a very, and if you ever met him, you would like him. He, was, he, wasn't, so, he wasn't so easily irritated as me. He was a fine guy. And so I, I just, I'm a little concerned if anybody starts, after all these years, going to whatever, what the documents we happen to have left, start criticizing Donald Atchison for this terrible tragedy, because I'm, he would, nothing would have, he would be deeply distressed if that had been suggested. Just going to move to a separate topic now, and that's the um, collection of blood, or practices for the collection of blood in the United Kingdom. Now, you told us yesterday uh, that you were aware in relation to imported 
blood products, that, that blood uh, was collected from prisons in the States. That was what started so the whole thing off when we first discovered, I think I first read in the newspapers, uh, that the Americans were apparently paying for blood donations. Um, I want to show you then one document relating to the, the UK's blood collection, um, PRSE 0004729, please. Um, now, this is not a minute that, uh, um, uh, as far as uh, uh, I uh, understand, what you would have seen at the time, um, Lord Clark. We can see it's dated, I think it's the 23rd of August, 1983. Um, it's from Mr. Wynn Stanley in the Health Services Branch. It's from a Mr. Miss Stanley to a Mr. Mr. Brown. Parker. Um, neither of whom I can remember. Uh, to Mr. Brown. And then you'll see it's copied to various people in the medical division and, 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 and the administrative divisions. If we look at the top, it says use of blood from prisons. Uh, it refers to a minute that I'm not going to take time looking at, but which raises the question of blood being collected from prisons. And then you'll see the response in paragraph two. It's difficult to advise any particular departmental policy on the collection of blood from brothels and prisons at the moment. It is for individual regional transfusion directors to determine how and from where donations are sought in the light of the targets they need to achieve and the numbers of donors on their panels. However, transfusion directors have been aware of the dangers of relying too heavily on prisons as a source of donation for some time, i.e. prior to the advent of AIDS as a cause of concern, because of the risk of hepatitis in prisons, also connected with a higher incidence of homosexuality, which can be spread through blood transfusion. Uh, nevertheless, although most regions, especially those with no shortage of donors, may not need to use prisons, there is at least one which has to view them as a major source of donations in order to meet targets. Um, and then there's a reference in paragraph four, AIDS is now, of course, called the wisdom of continuing to view prisons as a source of blood even further into question. Um, and then there's a suggestion that directors will consider it at their next m meeting. Um, it, it, so that, that, it, that would appear to suggest that as at August 1983, it was known within the department that there was some collection that had been ongoing from prisons, at least in one area, well, that and no particular it, it, itself, it speaks for itself. It yeah. does. Now, I just then want to ask you what you say about that in your statement. Um, uh, if we can go back to Lord Clark's statement, please show me. WITN 0758001 and go to page 86. Um, and we see paragraph 7.104. You were asked about this. Um, you, you say um, in the second sentence, I do not have any recollection of involvement in this issue at all. And then you refer to one of the documents that we've, we, we've just looked at. Um, c c can I just uh, check whether um, your position is you might have been aware of it, but you can't now recall that? Or do you think you were aware of it at the time? I simply can't recall. I have no idea. D does it surprise you that this was still ongoing apparently as at August 1983, and that ministers were not involved in, in the issue? No. Why? Well, it's not the sort of thing that goes to ministers, unless some official thinks it ought to go to ministers because there's a problem can't be sorted out. The, 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 going back to right when I started, the, the job of the private office is to ensure that the minister gets involved in things which the minister needs to get involved in and which the minister will... You know, probably think he ought to be involved in, and, and wants to see. You, if, if every every detail of every policy in the department of in the DHSS all had to go to a minister, and every minister, every minister, including the minister not directly responsible for the subject, had to be told this, you'd need hundreds of ministers to handle it, and as a way of taking decisions and running the health service, it would be chaotic. The health service was chaotic enough in the 1980s. You, 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 you have to have ministers do what ministers are for. They don't spend their time delving into documents, going into tedious detail about every medical problem and things which is being handled by people in the office. We've got, you've got thousands of civil servants 
I never did quite understand what they all did. I used to think we had too many civil servants. Bureaucracy was one of our troubles in the old DHSS. But they were very good ones, the ones I worked with. The medical officers were very good. But you, you, the minister wasn't expected to, you know, ministers weren't expected to be involved in absolutely everything that anybody was doing. I mean, if we'd had this inquiry at the time, I would have got just as exasperated. It was completely dotty to suggest that the Minister of State for Health, one of the junior ministers, who was not the minister responsible for blood products, should somehow expect to have been involved in all this. It's, it's well, just that's, crazy. That's not, in fact, the factual basis of my question. So I'm, I'm not suggesting... Well, I'm sorry, but I've given the answer to your question. Now, I would not have expected all this to have gone to some minister unless and until... The officials decided that they really should clear this with ministers, so they needed ministerial approval for some action they were proposing to take. So, d just so that I can understand, I'm not talking about that particular minute, and I'm not talking about something going to all ministers, including yourself. Is it your um, your view that the the the, the fact that um, blood was being collected from prisons in in England and Wales? That was not something any minister needed to know about. Well, probably yes. I mean, that, that, that prisoner's got lots of time on their hands, and as long as healthy prisoners are volunteering as blood donors, I'm not deeply shocked. The trouble in America was anybody could... could they got, were getting paid for it. So anybody with any kind of infection, drug addicts, all kinds of people... I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, presumably somebody ultimately found how big the problem was in America. I don't know it was how big it was in America. But they were actually paying... We weren't paying people in prison. Uh, I don't know, I hope we weren't. Uh, to give blows. They were volunteers. And there are lots of perfectly healthy people with nothing to do, uh, unfortunately, uh, in prison. And if in some regional transfusion director, who was the best person to make a judgment of that kind of thing, decided that it was safe to take blood donations from healthy prisoners, I, I, I don't think that's a matter of any excitement or, or concern. But obviously, because we were acquiring this terrible knowledge of the AIDS problem, you, you've shown me an official between, an exchange between un, two unknown officials showing that some people in the department were beginning to get a bit concerned about this. Presumably, until then, nobody... It's just part of the routine. I did, I, as it happens, I don't think, until I got my questions, I ever knew that we did collect in prisons. I, I don't know whether we collect in prisons now, do you? I haven't a clue. And I've been Justice Secretary. I've been... I'm Home Secretary. I've been responsible for prisons twice in my career. But if you ask me, do prisoners get asked to volunteer for blood donation, the answer is, as I sit here at the moment, I don't know. Um, can I then move to a slightly different topic? Um, the establishment of something called the Expert Advisory Group on AIDS. You, you, you noted it in, in one of the earlier documents we looked yeah, at, yeah. one of the papers referring to, to an expert advisory group was going to be set up. And it was... Um, I, I'm not going to take you to lots of documents about it. If I tell you, Law Clerk, and again, no doubt your legal representatives will tell me if they think there's particular documents you need to look at. Um, your, it, it was uh, um, uh, arrangements for it to be set up were being made in late 1984, and it met for the first time, it's called EGA, the acronym Expert Advisory Group on AIDS, in early 1985. Um, I don't think there's any evidence you were asked to take a particular decision about it at any uh, stage um, or, or any earlier stage. The, the person who made the ultimate decision about expert groups, which you would normally call it once you had a serious problem like this, would be the chief medical officer. Well, that, that answers my first question. My second question then is, um, do, do, do you have any concerns about or are you surprised at the fact that this, um, given everything we've looked at from 1983 onwards, that, that this particular... Um, um, expert group in relation to AIDS wasn't meeting until January 1985? Does that strike you as rather late in the day? I, mean, I'm not, I don't have an opinion on it. No, I'm not. No. Um, uh, and then... It, it there were lots of other expert groups as well. We've t we touched on all sorts of bodies, not all of whom I've ever heard of until we were going here. It was up to Donald and his team to decide what expertise they wished to call in, how to organise it. Um, and uh, it, it would appear that there wasn't um, um, direct communication between ministers and the expert groups. No, there wouldn't um, 
Uh, is there any reason why that couldn't have taken place with ministers attending meetings or ministers asking to have experts come well, and Well, they haven't been banned. If you remember, people got very upset because Dominic Cummings insisted on attending the meetings of SAGE, and a lot of the members of SAGE objected to this political figure turning up at their meetings because they strongly suspected he was, you know, he might be tempted to start trying to politicise uh, the, the, or, you know, the, 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 the findings of SAGE. So I... I would have been very surprised if I'd heard that some minister was insisting on turning up at a, a, a medical advisory group of this kind. So would it be right? I, I, I keep quoting Kobe, but it's fresher in everybody's memory, and it's a good example of the precise point you're making. There, there, was a, there was a fuss last year coming from the medics about Mr Cummings' insistence on going to... I think he probably stopped it eventually attending these expert advisory groups when they were discussing it. So would it be right to understand the practice or convention, but certainly at that time, possibly still, um, um, would, would be uh, ministers would be provided with information about recommendations of expert advisory groups, really if and only if it went through the chain of yes, medical officers... Yes, eventually the advice given to you by the medical officers, officers would be based officers. on the advice they were getting from these expert advisory groups. Can I then move, just before we break for lunch, um, to a, 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 different, um, a different topic now entirely, and the, the issue of the policy of self-sufficiency and the redevelopment of BPL. Um, when I didn't have anything to do with that. No. The, well, the redevelopment of BPL was a decision taken by Mr Finsberg in 1982. I'm not going to ask you about yep. the detail of that. Um, I've seen that from the paper. Um, when you were Minister of State for Health, um, first of all, did, did you understand that there was a formal policy of achieving self-sufficiency? Yeah. Um, I refer to it sometimes in parliamentary questions. Yes, and, and there are some statements, we can look at them if, if it would assist, but um, there are some statements where it, it seems to suggest that the government decided in 1982 upon a policy of self-sufficiency. Yeah, this is David Owen's point. It's I've got drawn to my attention some time ago. I'm sorry David's taken offence. David appears now to have taken offence that it's not acknowledged... We didn't let my parliamentary answers didn't acknowledge that he had had such a policy four or five years before. I had no idea he had such a policy. I had no idea what went on in the 1970s, and it's pretty obvious from the answers I gave that I didn't know we'd had that policy. We well, hadn't achieved self-sufficiency. I suspect the surge in demand for Factor Eight, when it started being routinely prescribed as a prophylactic, meant that whatever they did in... I don't know what they did about it in 1978, but it wasn't sufficient to catch up. So Geoffrey, Geoffrey Finsberg, again, nothing to do with me, uh, obviously decided that we really did major, need a major investment in the blood products laboratory at Elstree. As far as I'm aware, you can point out some of the rumors. My only involvement in the whole thing from beginning to end was, as I usually did quite often in the department, was to start inquiring when it started being delayed a bit and you had cost overruns. And I was, uh, you know, as usual, asking, you know, what are, who, who's in charge of this? What are we doing to keep to the timetable and control the costs? And, and, uh, and that was, I think, taken out of my hands when it's in the document somewhere. The permanent secretary, who's the chief accounting officer, it's his main job, but he's the chief civil servant, and he keeps cost controls and spending. He's meant to keep a direct day-to-day -day control on. It turned out that my memos alerted him, and he, 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 I got a little memo from him, and he said, this is all news to me, I think. He, no one had even bothered to tell him that this major project was in danger of slipping over costs, and I assume the permanent secretary intervened and made sure that something was done to make sure that the contractors and the blood products laboratory people weren't just being allowed to spend money as it came along, you know. Uh, but I don't recall that the otherwise the expansion of the blood products laboratory had anything to do with me as Minister of State at all. I think you, you as you've referred to, you did make, I think, statements from time to time in the House about well, the yes, policy because... in general terms and the redevelopment works. Um, I, I think this almost certainly follows logically from what you've said about not knowing there was a preceding policy from the 70s. Um, but I, I think it probably follows that you can't shed any light on what happened to the self-sufficiency policy be between the mid-70s and 1982. Haven't a clue. 
Um, do you, you may not remember this now, Lord Clark, but do you recall whether at the time, um, in the period 82 to 85, that there was a clear understanding within the department of what was meant by self-sufficiency? That we'd stop. The, main, the aim was to stop being dependent on imports from the United States of America. Um, and and um, uh, do you know whether it was um, uh, based upon self-sufficiency in terms of having enough blood products to provide for home treatment and prophylactic treatment of haemophiliacs, um, or, or whether it was based upon a, a less ambitious treatment program? It was presumably based on what was thought to be the necessary demand for the product. Other than that, I don't know. And you didn't have any involvement in the analysis? I have no of involvement. I, but I, if you found I'm, my memory is playing tricks with me, I apologise. I mean, if you found some documents suggesting that I had anything to do really much with Elstree, I think I made a visit to it once. I can't remember why somebody invited me to visit it, and I met the director, but it was, it was fairly inconsequential because I wasn't involved. But I, I'm not sure about that. I think I did. Uh, but I, I, I just don't recall that the, the thing was, was God, it had been decided by Geoffrey Finsberg was going ahead, and the main problems were, as they are with every public sector project, capital, major capital project, try to make sure that as far as possible, kept to time, and was kept somewhere near the cost. Uh, that's always been a big problem, and it was a very big problem in the 1980s, a very big problem in the strangely managed National Health Service. Do, do, do you um, recall having any information or being um, told anything about the, the position in relation to Scotland or Northern Ireland? In I had absolutely, then and now, I had no idea what the position was in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, Sir, so, uh, th there are a couple of documents I'm going to ask Lord Clark to look at before we then move on to his second period in office, but uh, if we do it at two o'clock, I can probably cut down on the number of documents that we need to usefully uh, yes, look well, at. Shall we, shall I don't think there's much more I can tell you about my, my involvement in this when I was Minister of State, except to repeat what I said when I started, that I don't think anybody, hardly anything ever came to me for my personal decision. I was not the minister, I was a junior minister in the department, I was not the minister responsible for blood products. Well, we will shortly after lunch move on to your time as Secretary of State for Health, Lord Clark. Uh, and so we'll take a break now until... By that time, the tragedy was all over and I was involved then in financial, the finances of it. That was, that was, that was my involvement then. Uh, two o'clock. Thank you, sir. Two o'clock. <laughs>